Zoom, but a transparent connection between strangers. In a few moments, I will be joined by strangers such as that brought together to work towards a common goal to elaborate on a bit of the imagery in Tennessee Williams' Glass Menagerie. And how else could we do it but through a memory of our own? What's up? So you guys ready to start? Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. So Jacob, you're up first, right? Yeah. Who's sharing the screen? I'll share it. So my name is Jacob, and we're going to be doing imagery and glass menagerie. So to begin this, uh, before we even get into it, obviously we need to know what imagery is. Uh, and so the text defines it as the use of sensory language to represent objects, actions, or ideas. Uh, for me personally, what I just think of it as is it creates an image for different given circumstances of the play. Now the question is, why is this important? Why do we care, right, like of the imagery in the play? And the reason for this is because when we're able to get detailed um, like descriptions for different given circumstances, it adds a deeper meaning to each given circumstance. And the deeper meaning behind each given circumstance only adds to the world of the play and will help all people who are part of the play. So to start, I'm gonna be talking about the imagery in the beginning, uh, specifically to do when he's describing the apartment. So he starts it off by saying, the Wingfield apartment is in the rear of the building, one of those vast hive-like conglomerations of cellular living units that flower as warty growths. So the part that stuck out to me immediately was that he said that the apartments flower, right? And so when I think of something flowering, I think of it like just coming from the floor, like the ground, like naturally, right? And a big part of what that has to do with it coming naturally, uh, for me personally, like if I see a building that just looks like it belongs there, oftentimes I think maybe it's older, right? And so I think that gives depth to the society and that the world around it may be older. Along with that, he compares the apartments to hive-like conglomerations. And immediately I thought of a beehive. I put an image of one there. And what makes beehives so interesting is that although they're so intricate, they're all the same. There's no individuality. And I think that almost compares to the apartments where all the apartments are the same. From the outside, they all look the same. But through this play, we understand like there's something different going on in the apartment where our characters are. It gives that depth to the society. And what that does is like for actors or directors, knowing that although these apartments are the same and everything around it is moving, there's something important going on in this one. To continue, I just wanted to talk about the imagery when he's talking about the fireplace. So he says, the apartment faces an alley and is entered by a fire escape, a structure whose name is a touch of poetic truth for all of these buildings are always burning with the slow and implacable fires of human desperation. Uh, immediately for me, it added life to the fire escape, right? He could have easily said, there's a fire escape. That's how they get inside the house. But instead he says the apartment faces an alley and is entered by a fire escape. When he says that it's entered by a fire escape, I almost imagine it to be like obtrusive. Like it has its own presence. The fire escape means more than just a fire escape. And it even shows how the apartment could be trapping. And that's even more supported when he says that for all of these buildings are always burning with the slow and implacable fires of human desperation. They're trapped in there. For them, their, their world is, is like a hell, you know, because realistically, like when you see uh, a fire escape as an entrance, that doesn't necessarily scream the most lavish life, right? And so it gives depth to the economics of the world and it shows how the apartment's trapping and how like their world is almost like a hell. So that's my part. Okay, cool. So then in my part, I wanted to talk about the imagery at the beginning of scene four and just how it affects the world of the play in its entirety. So the, the scene begins with Tom coming home drunk from being out of the movies all night. And then he ended up also seeing a magician. And he, as he tries to get in through the fire escape, he drops his keys into a crack. Laura ends up finding him and helping him in. And they kind of have this nice little moment where Amanda's not there. It's just them talking. Um, and he kind of, he ends up saying that he's drunk because he, Help the magician with not the first performance, but both performances, proving that the water had indeed turned to whiskey. But um, the important piece of this section was one, the colorful scarf, that rainbow scarf that he gave to um, Laura, which symbolizes so much. Um, I'll cover that in a little bit, but then also how he talks about the coffin scene. And I feel like that really affects the world of the play because it kind of gives you a little door to walk through to look at his perception of this world. And it really, it's not the best. It's all just gloomy and dry. It's like he's living in a loop. 
And that's really why this scene stuck out the most to me. Um, next slide. So then, first of all, there's the magic scarf. Um, he ended up saying, this is his magic scarf. You can have it, Laura. You can wave it over um, canaries, and you get a bowl of goldfish. You wave it over a goldfish, and you get canaries who fly away. Um, so it has, like, these magical properties. Um, when I first read this, though, I kind of thought that the scarf was, like, a simile to not only Laura's glass menagerie, but also Laura, because when you have light, as you can see in the picture right there. When you have light go into glass like that, it turns into all of the colors of the rainbow. So it kind of represents the menagerie, but then it also kind of shows Laura in a way because Laura is represented by her menagerie and it shows just the fragility of Laura and how she's just as magical and col colorful as the menagerie, but she's just as fragile as it. And then there's also, like we talked about in class, there was those magical properties of it. And she ended up waving it around Tom to grant him protection and like good fortune, stuff like that. And then in Anne's version of the play, she ended up just having Laura keep it on her for the rest of the play. Um, so that kind of, it does help your imagination when you're thinking about the play. Cause after that, it's like, you want to think about Laura as like she's being followed by a trail of like glitter or something sparkles because of this magical scarf that she's always wearing. Um, next slide. But then the main point of this scene was the coffin. Um, and he said right here, we nailed him into a coffin. He got out of the coffin without removing a single nail. There was a trick to that that would come in handy for me. And this is a lot deeper than one might think. Is obviously what comes to my first is how his father did the same thing. He left the family without destroying it somehow, even though it's a far from functional family. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of, it, in this scene, it kind of shows that Tom really is in this loop of just work over and over, providing for his family, go to the movies. It's like his life is essentially meaningless. Um, and he really, he does long to do the same thing as Malvolio and his father. He wishes he could leave without destroying the coffin, which is the apartment. And when you think of your own home as a coffin, that's, it really changes your perspective of how he sees this whole memory. It's like, it's not really something that you have hopes and dreams with it's like you're already buried six feet under and your fate has already been sealed and you're just kind of waiting until you rot away mm -hmm. and that that it's that's a tough life to live so once you kind of look into this and allow it to like change your image of their apartment it it already wasn't good but now it's just terrible far from heaven um, but I think that this is like one of the biggest reasons why he does leave in the end, obviously, but when you really look at the world through his eyes, it makes the, his choices so clear. Um, next slide. So, yeah, it's, this is kind of, when I saw this image, it really reminded me of Tom because it's, like he wakes up every day with his mom saying rise and shine. And honestly, this is all I think of. It's just another day. You're still mm -hmm. six feet under, nowhere to go. You're just living your life in a loop. Um, next slide. And that brings me to my final point, how it all just affects the world of the play. Um, it just, the coffin metaphor completely darkens your perspective of his entire world. And each character has their own little version of the world. Amanda has hers, but Tom's is really, I would say the darkest by far. Um, like I was saying, it's far from heaven. It's like his life is just in a loop. He's not dead, but it's like he's locked in a coffin and all he wishes he could do is do the same trick as the magician. Um, there's no sunshine, no dreams, no hope. It's like he's just doomed forever. And this is precisely why Tom ends up leaving later on.
So that's why I thought that this scene was so incredibly important and the imagery that it creates just completely changes your perspective of the story. All right, so that covers everything. I think Anna is taking over next. In this part, I will talk about the idea of imagery between the scene right before the gentleman caller arrives. Now, this is the scene where Laura and Amanda are getting ready for this specific gentleman caller. Now, I will start off by saying the context of the scene. Now, the context of the scene is obviously Amanda and Laura are getting ready to set up for the gentleman caller. It starts off with Laura trying on this dress and Amanda standing there tailoring it to her and where we find out that Laura truly is terrified of the situation and is not thrilled about it. This scene also includes the famous John Quills monologue where Amanda goes on and on about her wonderful John Quills. And it also is the scene where there's information about the gentleman caller where Amanda finds out that Laura has some type of connection to this gentleman caller and makes Laura even more nervous. Now the imagery of the gay deceivers. Now gay deceivers, the best way to describe it would be stuffing a bra, kind of like that idea, but the way that Laura describes it is that gay deceivers are stuffing her bosom to set up a trap. Now this trap is what makes the imagery very important. By stuffing, you're hiding. Just like this entire show is about hiding their family and how it's so fragile due, of course, to the glass menagerie. But she uses this quickly against Laura and it shows where, how Amanda views her. Now by stuffing and hiding, it shows that Amanda is trying to hide the flaws of Laura. It's quick yet useful and you can also see where Amanda's priorities lie about her personal personal story as well as her daughter's. Now we all know that Amanda is extremely manipulative and one of the things that she says in the scene is now look at yourself young lady this is the prettiest you will ever be which is sort of like a backhand backhanded compliment towards Laura and when Amanda leaves to go get ready for herself which is kind of weird in a mother sense, Laura is left to look at herself and stare in the mirror painfully, knowing that her mother wants to hide things about her and this family as well, left there to realize that Amanda's priorities are not correct. And this is supposed to be her moment with the gentleman caller, and yet the mother tries to steal and manipulate this moment. Now, the imagery with the John Quills, or as Amanda likes to say, the John Quills, the John Quills. So, John Quills are actually a type of flower that is known for their very bright yellow color. And in my personal opinion, in this imagery shows that Amanda's youth represents Amanda's youth, if you will. It also brings up the idea of their father and how they met. So in the actual monologue, she talks about her John Quills and how she met this boy and she had this fever and oh, it was such a different time. Now back in her youth, she explains how young, rambunctious and how many men she had in her life. And it represents this brightness due to its bright color of her past, but also highlights the dullness of her now and how she's come from then to now. It also how she never wants to let go of her youth due to the fact of the father being part of the reason why the John Quills are very important in this scene, but also shown through how many John Quills she collects and how she really emphasizes on how she never wanted to let them go. And part of her still never wants to let the idea of her youth go, as well as the father due to the fact that she believes that he'll come back, which also brings in and ties into the fact of Tennessee Williams' actual real life mother and how their father was never really around. And I just think that's a great use of imagery on Tennessee's part. And one of the quotes that I pulled out says, mother said, honey, there's no more room for John Quills. And still I kept bringing in more John Quills. Whenever, wherever I saw them, I'd say, stop, stop. I see the John Quills. I made the young men help me gather the John Quills. It was a joke, Amanda and her John Quills. Finally, there was no more vases to hold them and every space was filled with John Quills. No more vases. All right, I'll hold them myself. Okay, cool. So um, for my section of our project, I would like to discuss the differences, the different use of imagery through the words of the title of the play. At first, I was just going to talk about how Tennessee Williams used glass to represent Laura's delicate nature, but as I dug more into the script, 
I saw that Laura was not the only personification of glass in the story, but I, but I will talk about the use of personification of glass through Laura first. So um, you can go to the next one. Within the play, we learn that the simplest of interactions are what most will consider simple, like completing a test in class proves difficult for Laura. So I, I liked to take, what I wanted to do was take um, quotes from the play and actually use them as like a, a description of the character. So for Laura, I like, be careful if you breathe, it breaks. This was her talking to the gentleman called Jim, um, handing him the unicorn, which is kind of like handing herself or her hope to him. Um, so she said, be careful if you breathe, it breaks, which just proves how fragile Laura actually is. So for the gentleman caller, Jim, I was surprised he said, I'm not made of glass. And through classes and through reading the script, we see that um, Jim is normal. Everybody else in the, in the play is some different version of an extreme. Um, and Jim is what you consider to be normal. So he's like, I'm not made of glass. I'm not part of this menagerie you guys got going on. So the Wingfield family dynamic can be described as glass breaks so easily, no matter how careful you are. I feel like that's for the whole family together, but also um, for Tom himself, because he's trying to do his best for the family, but also is dying for adventure. But what I did want to go over was the actual definition of glass and how it really ties in. So the definition of glass is a hard, brittle substance, typically transparent or translucent, made by fusing together soda, lime, and sometimes other ingredients and cooling rapidly. It is used to make windows, drinking containers, and other articles. So, um, and then Tennessee, in the production notes, he said, when you look at a piece of delicately spun glass, you think of two things, how beautiful it is. And that's what Jim said to Lauren when they were sitting down next to the candles and he was kind of flirting and how easily it can be broken. And I feel like that represents their family as a whole. Next slide, please. So menagerie personification, it belongs to the animals, said Amanda. So the definition of menagerie is a collection of wild animals kept in captivity for exhibition or a strange or diverse collection of people or things, the enclosure of where they are kept. Uh, Jacob already talked about this, um, their, where they live. And I just wanted to, um, because I was reading the definition of menagerie and I was like, that's a zoo, but it's not a zoo. So <laughs> it's different because it's a, a strange, diverse collection of people or things as well, a collection of wild or exotic animals. And a, and a zoo is a park where animals are exhibited, normal, typical things. Um, why I wanted to bring up the personification of the animals is that Amanda really puts Tom in a light where she calls him basically an animal with just instincts. And there's like a, a back and forth with that. So the play opens up with Amanda, their mom telling Tom to chew. Chew, chew, animals have secretions in their stomach which enable them to digest food and mastication. But humans began being, human beings, sorry, are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down. And then later in the play, Tom says, man is, and they're talking about how Tom really wants to go out. He's not happy in his job. Like Ben said, he feels like he's encased in a coffin. He feels like this is, you know, this is the end. This is all it's going to be for me. And he longs for more. And that's what they were talking about. So it said, so Tom says, man is an instinct, instinct for adventure, a lover, a hunter, and fighter. And what Amanda has to say to that is instinct is something that people have got away from. It belongs to the animals. So she really like sets in that he's, he's the animal in the menagerie. Next slide. Glass as a metaphor. So um, glass represents the fragility of the family through the transparency of Tennessee's memory. Um, 
you can tell that that's what's going on because in the beginning of the play, he says that the walls are transparent. So there's a lot of transparency going around, but also it was mentioned before in class that like this is like a, a built up version, a version that he wished was probably true instead of what actually happened. Just like we know that um, he didn't actually call his mom the old ugly witch. He called his sister that, and that's what kind of made her spin out of control. So um, another metaphor was Laura's life outcome mirroring her mother will become old spinsters. So mirroring in a way where, you know, two people are standing on two sides of a piece of glass and they're just, I feel like um, Amanda is trying to live through Laura. So Laura doesn't make the same mistakes as her, but the way Laura is, she's in her own world as was said in the play. And there's, they're trying to put her out there. They're trying to get her out of her comfort zone, but it just seems like they're going to end up sad old maids or old spinsters together. And another glass metaphor was Tom will abandon Laura just as their father abandoned Amanda. So yes, Tom and Laura are brother and sister and not husband and wife, but their family dynamic is kept together by Tom. And honestly, uh, with Amanda's calling for magazine subscriptions is not going to give them a life that they need. So if Tom leaves the factory and leaves them, they will become old spinsters and you know, Amanda's worst nightmares will become true. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So uh, the metaphor in Menagerie. So Tom's memory of Laura is kept in him, in his mind, through the transparent fourth wall. Uh, he uses that language right before, like to describe the scene um, going into the first, going into the first scene, we'll, we're taking a peek into his mind. Um, a memory of himself kept in captivity and finally escaped to follow the instinct of adventure. So like I said before, his mom personified him as an animal and this is the memory of him following the instinctual animalistic like dream of adventure. And again, uh, menagerie, the definition is a stranger diverse collection of people or things, the enclosure of where they are kept. Amanda talks about how her children are different from herself and are so strange. And basically what I said before with the glass everything is mirroring each other. She, unlike, you know, um, Laura, unlike Amanda, has no gentleman caller. She stays in her own world. She plays with these glass. She doesn't play with them, but she worships these glass animals. And, um, and Tom is going to leave her just like her husband did in a devastating situation. So the metaphor in the title that I feel like the metaphor in the title is and it's an instinctive animal in a glass case is bound to break through leaving shards of glass behind. And that's what I feel the metaphor of glass menagerie is. So with my imagery, something that really stuck out for me was the, uh, the blow out your candles, Laura monologue. Um, to me, what I got from it was, uh, it signified the snuffing of Laura's hopes and her dreams but there's a little bit more to that. Um, Tom's final monologue uh, kind of comes after he leaves after um, the gentleman caller, after what like his mom had accused him of playing such a sick joke on them, but he had no idea. And that was the final straw for him. And he just ended up leaving. Um, he comes back and the final monologue is less to his mother more to Laura and he explains his adventures and things that he's done how he got fired and going from state to state doing all this and that and then it was almost like he was being haunted by the memory of his family and that's what drew him back um and then nostalgia hits him uh familiar music the transparent glass and it's almost like when he really thinks of it, he's taken into a daydream 
and Laura touches his shoulder and he looks into her eyes. And at that moment, what really stuck out to me was how um, it, he wanted to kind of plead his case and justify why he left the way he did. Um, he wanted Laura almost to understand that he just needed to get out. And also how by her blowing out her candles, that would be like a symbol of her letting him go as well. Um, and so goodbye, that's what he said. And from that, I, um, I think he's finally able to really like move on with his life. I know that reading through it, it seemed like he was stuck in a loop of things, but with him asking her to blow out the candles and giving that final like farewell, that was to me kind of the start of a, of a new uh, throughout the play, like the world of the play was pretty bleak, but I think that's a little bit bittersweet. He's saying goodbye, leaving his family behind once and for all without really ever seeing them, but just making his own peace. I feel like I didn't, I didn't talk about the world, uh, not the world of the play, but like the purgatory or, or hell or heaven. I feel like while he is in um, the apartment with his family. I feel like that is his purgatory. And a little bit of like, say, this whole play, I feel like is his purgatory. And now that he's finally able to say goodbye to Laura, he can go a little bit, you know, taste a little bit of heaven. Good. That was good. Ate that shit up. Left no crumbs. Let's no. go, Viola. Don't worry. It'll just cut to me starting. It's okay. Shh, shh. Ah! Okay. <laughs> Can you cut that out, Jason? Thank you.